Welcome to the World Shared Practice Forum. I'm Dr. Jeff Burns, Chief of Critical Care at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. We're very pleased to have with us today Dr. Jacques Lacroix. Dr. Lacroix is Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Montreal, and he is also on the Faculty for Pediatric Critical Care Medicine at the Hospital St. Justine in Montreal, Canada. Uh, Jacques, welcome to the World Shared Practice Forum. Uh, and on behalf of my colleagues around the world, um, we acknowledge the wonderful research that you've done for decades now on transfusion medicine. And we also know that you've developed a research interest in multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. What is multiple organ dysfunction syndrome? Well, the concept of multiple organ dysfunction, or MODS, if you want, appeared uh, uh, 40 years ago in, in the uh, 1975. And the idea was just because Dr. Bo and colleagues uh, found in their surgical patients that some patients developed more and more organ dysfunctions, and that something was happening that was not only an addition of organ dysfunction, but something was going on. Over the years, by the way, many names have been use, used for, uh, to describe multiple organ dysfunction syndromes, like multiple organ failure, or uh, uh, even hypermetabolism organ failure complex, and other names. But presently, I think there is a consensus to keep and use the name multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. So uh, uh, what it is, the uh, definition presently of MODS is quite simple. Uh, there is a MODS in a critically ill patients if we have served at the same time this function of two organs. And uh, up to seven organs are um, uh, considered. There are a few lists of diagnostic criteria. We'll talk about that in a minute. But we are looking at respiratory, cardiovascular, neurological, hematological, renal, hepatic, and in one case, gastrointestinal. The, at least, uh, I think the, the, the most important uh, job was done first by Dr. Wilkinson in 1986 because they were the people who suggest uh, uh, some criteria for pediatric multiple organ dysfunction syndromes. But 10 years later, we felt that we must a little bit adapt that. So my colleague, uh, uh, Francois Prou suggests uh, a, a new list. And in 2005, Dr. Goldstein in the symposium on sepsis and MODS uh, 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 just brought up a new list of diagnostic criteria. So presently, we have many lists uh, uh, of diagnostic criteria, and uh, uh, we'll discuss a bit later about the problem that uh, uh, can happen with those different lists. So I, I said to you, MODS is not the only addition of organ system dysfunction, and it is characterized in typical MODS, well-blown MODS, you will find high, high blood levels of both pro- and anti-inflammatory uh, uh, agents, which is strange because usually in normal inflammation, first you have a, a release of uh, pro-inflammatory. After a while, the anti-inflammatory comes in, stops the release of pro, and the inflammation stops this way. But in MODS, something happens that, it, that is wrong, and you will see at the same time very high levels of pro- and anti-inflammatory uh, uh, mediators. There are many other characteristics also that we can see in those patients. I will talk about physiopathology a little uh, uh, later on. So if we look, if we look at MODS, MODS is indeed, indeed characterized by a consistent group of organ system and dysfunction. It, it, it is common in the ICU. It's at least 20% of our patients. Uh, uh, the mechanism is not clearly delineated, but we know, as I told you, that there is a, a common denominator, which is a, a, an uncontrolled inflammatory process. Some people talk about a, a, an inflammatory storm. Many conditions can cause MODS. Uh, an infection can cause a MODS, and then we call that a sepsis. Uh, a trauma, hypoxia, shock, uh, uh, even intoxication can cause MODS. And by the way, MODS is closely associated with mortality. So it fills up very well the, the uh, criteria of a syndrome. We'd like to stop now and ask our colleagues around the world a question. In your answer, could you first please state your city and country location? And the question is this. In your pediatric intensive care unit, what is the common inciting process that triggers multiple organ dysfunction syndrome? For example, infection, trauma, or unknown causes.
We're back now with Dr. Jacques Lacroix. So maybe I can talk a little bit about the relationship between MODS uh, and sepsis, because in, uh, for some people it's different, and I believe that sepsis is just a specific type of MODS. It is a MODS caused by an infection. So uh, before we talk about that, we have to, to t talk a little bit about the systemic inflammatory response syndromes. By the way, some people believe this is not a syndrome at all, but at least it brings the idea that some of our patients, at least in the ACU, have a, a, a severe uh, inflammatory response. And some criteria have, is, uh, have been suggested to diagnose a SEERS. I will not go through all these criteria, but one is about temperature, about respiratory rate, about leukocyte, leukocyte count, uh, and uh, heart rate too, too. But they are not very specific. The point is that a sepsis is a, a systemic inflammatory response syndrome with an infection. That's why we have to talk a little bit about a SEERS. A severe sepsis is a sepsis with uh, a cardiovascular uh, dysfunction, uh, an acute respiratory distress syndrome, or, or two or more organ dysfunction. In a septic shock, well, in a septic shock, it is a sepsis with a shock. That, that's it. Now, uh, on that figure there, uh, I, uh, the first step in the figure showed the relationship between a, a SEERS, a, symptom, a systemic inflammatory response syndrome, a multiple organ dysfunction syndrome, and death. Well, with sepsis, what happened is that the cyst is caused by an infection, and we immediately named that a sepsis. If it is severe enough, severe sepsis, and if there is a shock, septic shock. All these conditions, this, I call that these septic states, can uh, develop to, to become a MODS. And by the way, septic shock is a MODS. But I, I really want to repeat that a significant proportion of multiple organ dysfunction syndrome are caused by non-infectious insult. And clinically, MODS caused by an infection or not caused by an infection are absolutely similar. You cannot make the difference, well, most of the time. You know, if you get a purpura fulminans, it's obvious that there is an infection behind that, or a congenital deficiency of pretty but but that's it. But in most instances, you cannot, when the patient get in the ICU, you will not be able to make the difference between a multiple organ dysfunction syndrome caused by an infection or not. Maybe th this is why in many randomized controlled trials on sepsis at the end, they were not able to find an infection in most instances. And probably these are, uh, randomized controlled trials were more about MUDs than about sepsis, but that's an, uh, an hypothesis that I, I bring out. To give you an idea of the uh, importance of the problems, uh, there are not too much data on the epidemiology of sepsis states and MUDs, and by the way, I hope that there will be more in the forthcoming years. But uh, um, uh, uh, 20 years ago at St. Justin, we follow our patients, all consecutive patients, over one year. And we uh, report that 23% uh, of those patients got sepsis or have sepsis when they get in, 4% uh, severe sepsis, 2% septic shock, and in those years, 18% have MODS. And if you look in the literature presently, the incidence rate of MODS in PICU patients range most of the time between 11% and 25%. Well, it's in some papers it goes even higher than that. But the usual range is between 11% is between and 25%. So it is frequent, uh, and uh, all of us observe that quite frequently. I'd like to stop now and ask our colleagues around the world a question. The question is this. In your pediatric intensive care unit, approximately what percentage of your patients have the diagnosis of multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. We're back now with Dr. Jacques Lacroix. Well, Jacques, um, it's uh, one of those syndromes that I, I know all the intensivists around the world are thinking, I know it when I see it, and yet it's hard to articulate how to diagnose it. How, how does one diagnose it? Well, with MODS, presently, uh, as I told you, the definition of MODS is there is a MODS if we observe uh, at least two organ dysfunction at the same time in patients. And we considered a list of uh, uh, up to seven organ dysfunction. Uh, uh, presently, the uh, list that are used to diagnose MODS are the list uh, suggested by Dr. Prou in 1996. 
and the list uh, published by Dr. Goldstein in 2005. And one of the problems is that those, those lists are, are not similar. And because they are not similar, it, it bring, bring out different epidemiology. Uh, among the caveats and pit, pitfalls about those two lists of, uh, or those, those two sets of diagnostic criteria of MODS is that at least in one set, they just did not take into account uh, uh, age. So age, uh, hemoglobin level change with age. White blood cells counts are, the normal range is not the same in the first days of life than they are in adolescence. Same thing for creatinine. And also another problem is that there is significant difference in the criteria listed in the two different set of diagnostic criteria. I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm not just saying they are different. And that uh, is uh, or can be a problem. To give you an example, I just compare on, on that slides the criteria of Goldstein for uh, uh, cardiovascular dysfunction and the criteria by PRU and, and by Wilkinson before that. And you'll see they are quite different. Uh, with Goldstein, it starts with one question. Did the patient receive a bolus or at least a bolus of at least 40 milliliters per kilogram per in the last hour? And if so, then we're looking to different criteria. Well, with PRU, we, uh, nobody were looking for a bolus of liquids. So what is better, I don't know, but there is a significant difference. So just to see what is this difference, uh, we start a, a prospective study in 2009 uh, at St. Justin Hospital over a year. And, and we did that over a year to be sure that there was no seasonal bias. Uh, and at the end, you can see on that slide the difference in the prevalence at PICU entry of MODS. Uh, with PRU criteria, criteria we, the diagnosis, by the way, were done by an adjudicating committee. Uh, and with PRU, uh, they diagnosed uh, MODS at entry in, in about 15% of patients, while in Goldstein, it was about 30%. Uh, and we look also at the what happens thereafter. And, if we add the um, MODS present at entry and the incident MODS, with PRU, it was uh, 21%, and with Goldstein, 37%. So a, a huge difference in the incidence rate w uh, when we use those two different lists. Um, so we go further and uh, ask the question, uh, uh, did these two sets of diagnostic criteria diagnose MODS in the same patients? Because maybe it's not the case. So we look at that. Again, two adjudicators did that without knowing they were independent. And what did they find? Well, first, if we look at MODS at PICU entry, the concordance was 81%, which is good. But we also look at the Kappa score. Uh, Kappa score tell you uh, if uh, the concordance was statistically significant, uh, statistically different than uh, hazards uh, uh, can bring out. And the Kappa score was uh, point uh, 0.49, which is moderate. It's not huge. It's not too bad, but it's not so good. We also knew, uh, look at new MODs, the MODs that appear after patients get in the ICU. Again, well, a greater concordance, it was 93%. But the Kappa score is still 0.5. So altogether, uh, we have quite good concordance, quite good Kappa, uh, a moderate Kappa score, but not it's far from perfect. So we look at the different organ dysfunction in the same study, trying to find why uh, this happens, and 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 this on this slide you can see what we found with the different organ dysfunction. Uh, and immediately you can see that most of the discrepancy came from cardiovascular system because uh, with, when we look just at cardiovascular systems, the concordance looks great, 86%, but the Kappa score was 0 uh, 17 very low. And uh, so quite the same thing with the neurological system. Quite good concordance, uh, 67 is not so bad but the Kappa score is 0.34, again, very low. So again, I'm not saying that one list is better than the other, but this showed that these two lists are not looking at the same patients. So take home message about MODS, MODS diagnosis. The two sets of diagnostic criteria that I was talking about are not interchangeable. 
and can mislead readers on the epidemiology of mods. To give you an example, if you look on papers that use uh, Goldstein criteria and on papers that look on fruit criteria, you will have, uh, 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 it will tell you that there are more mods in, in, in the last years than the 90s. But probably the difference is just because we use different diagnostic criteria. Another uh, uh, lesson, I think, is that the diagnostic criteria of MUD should be revisited, uh, uh, at least some of the criteria that we are uh, using presently. And also another lesson is that one cannot change the, the diagnostic criteria of a disease or a syndrome like MUDs without changing its epidemiology and its capacity to describe or, pre or to predict outcomes. So, you know, in papers frequently we read that people has used a list uh, or a, a, of diagnostic criteria, but a modified list. Well, it means that you cannot compare that modified list with the list we have before because they have modified the list. So modifying a list uh, have uh, uh, impact on the epidemiology and uh, uh, on the uh, capacity to describe outcomes again. I'd like to stop now and ask our colleagues around the world a question. In your answer, could you first please state your city and country location? And the question is this, what criteria do you use to diagnose multiple organ dysfunction syndrome? We're back now with Dr. Jacques Lacroix. So Jacques, uh, I can't help but wonder, in your practice at the Hospital Justine in Montreal, which criteria do you use? At the bedside, we use the Goldstein criteria presently. But when I'm doing research, I use both. Because frequently, when I want uh, to compare some data with study that used the criteria of PRU, I want to be able to use the criteria of PRU. To give you an example, with some of the study I've done in transfusion medicine, the criteria of Goldstein were not available. So I, if I want to be able to understand the result of some of my study, I have to use the criteria of PRU. So what I'm suggesting to people, you can do what you want, but if you do research and compare to something that use criteria of PRU, you have to use it again. Same thing, you know, it's true for the PRISM score also. If you want to compare a study while they use the old PRISM score, uh, you need to get data for the PRISM score too. What is the pathophysiology of, of multiple organ dysfunction syndrome? I will dare saying that we don't know what start MODS. But once MODS is well um, uh, organized uh, uh, in full blown uh, MODS, it is quite clear, clear what's going on. And uh, at least 20 years ago, Michael Pinsky wrote that severe sepsis and MODS, and I quote, can be thought of as a, a, the endocrine expression of cytokine effects because it requires a systemic response for signals that normally function on an autocrine or paracrine levels. To give you an example, if you have a, a small um, injury uh, on the skin, uh, there will be some tumor necrosis factors that will be produced, some interleukins, and uh, etc. But the, it, it will remain there. If it is a huge infection, it will expand all over the body, and then you can get multiple organ uh, dysfunction syndromes. Another example of that, I th another uh, data that we know that is important, if you give, uh, if you inject tumor necrosis factors, which is not infectious at all, it's a, a, a cytokine. It's one of the first cytokine in the uh, inflammatory cascade. Well, if you inject TNF, you will get uh, in the animal, because we inject animals, it, uh, uh, a septic psych, uh, state that will look exactly as a sepsis, but it's not a sepsis. And if you inject enough TNF, you'll get a MODS, a multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. And uh, another point that I want to raise again is that new infection is found even by autopsy in more than 50% of cases of severe inflammatory response syndrome in our patients, uh, uh, even if the patients present the clinical hallmark of septic state. So what I'm saying again is what differentiates sepsis and MODS or severe sepsis and MODS is really that there is an infection in sepsis, but actually how to differentiate that at the bedside is not so obvious. In MODS, I, I told you that what is 
character, uh, characteristic of severe MODs is there is at the same time a lot of pro-inflammatory and inflammatory, uh, inflammatory mediators. And by a lot, I, I mean uh, uh, sometimes the level, the blood level are, are huge. Uh, uh, and another thing that is lost in, in well-blown MODs is that the uh, retro, uh, pro- and anti-inflammatory retroaction system is not working well. We observe at the same time both high and low uh, uh, pro- and anti-inflammatory mediators. Uh, and if the, these devils are high enough, at least in kids, we know that it predicts mortality. So there, there is a link there. Uh, what brings, what can cause this uh, inflammatory storms? It can be in, an, in an, a severe infection or it can be multiple little uh, insults. Let's talk about the big insults, like purpura fulminans. When we have a big insults, a big hit like that, uh, it, it can be enough, the aggression can be severe enough to uh, 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 prime cells first, like macrophage, endothelial cells, leukocytes. And then if the aggression is really severe, AMODs will result. Uh, and we know that, for example, with purpura fulminans, again, in this case, one it is there, and that's enough. But something strange happens in our patients in the ICU. Sometimes they get with, for example, just an asthma crisis, and that's it. There is no organ, organ dysfunction at all. And then they get something else, a little hint. They get a, a little nosocomial infection, something that in normal people will not bring out any problems. But in our patients, sometimes it's enough to trigger a mass. And uh, uh, behind that is the two hits or multiple hits theory. I told you that uh, uh, once there is an insult in critically ill patients, uh, our, our inflammatory cells are prime. It doesn't mean they are activated, they are prime. But if a, a small or a trivial insult come in at the wrong time, it can uh, 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 cause an overreaction of these cells and then you get a MODS. So again, in MODS, there is a, a, a huge amount of infra, uh, inflammatory mediators, and they can, uh, the retro control system is not, is not working at all. It's not all. We also observe disturbed apoptosis uh, in patients with MODS. And what's the link with the inflammatory process is not so clear. But we know, for example, that tumor necrosis factors interleukin 1 or 6 retard apoptosis in white blood cells and macrophage. So maybe uh, uh, there is something there also. But again, something that is normal behave uh, in a way that is not normal in, in patients with MADS. So to summarize what I've said, at the molecular levels, we observe high blood levels of a lot of inflammatory uh, bioreactive agents. At the cellular levels, I talk about, uh, I did not talk about uh, mitochondrial dysfunction uh, because I can talk about that for a long time, but in full-blown uh, MUDs, there is a mitochondrial dysfunction. In, in severe sepsis, it's always there. The, uh, and this translates with uh, problems uh, with acid, uh, lactic acidosis if the infection is severe enough, uh, and it results in a cellular in a, an energetic crisis, and maybe what we observe in, um, in MODs it, uh, starts in the mitochondria, maybe. That's an hypo hypothesis. At the organ system levels, as I told you, there is a problem between the, in, uh, in the interaction uh, uh, within systems and between systems. Uh, for example, in, in full-blown MODs, uh, 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 we lose a normal variability in systems like the inflammatory systems, no retrocontrols, the respiratory system, the cardiovascular system, and even the endocrinological system. And as I told you, there is simul simultaneous uh, dysfunction of many organ uh, di dis dysfunction. Um, Jacques, um, are there uh, unrecognized complications of MODs uh, that we're not appreciating in the intensive care unit? Uh, there are a few uh, uh, that are not uh, uh, as well recognized as I will like. To give you an example, TAMA for thromb thrombocytopenia associated multiple organ failure has been described by Joe Carcillo uh, and his team in, in Pittsburgh. Uh, uh, TAMA is a specific type of MODS, it's a MODS, with a low platelet counts and more than three organ failures. In a small study, but well done study, they follow prospectively 
37 consecutive PICU patients with at least two organ dysfunction, while 28, or if you want, 76% of those patients had TAMOF, and all the seven patients who die had TAMOF. So TAMOF is maybe can is is important at least in that subgroup of patients. With patients with TAMOF, we found uh, in, uh, uh, von Willebrand factors, uh, rich microvascular thrombosis, and uh, uh, those children with TAMOF had decreased ADAM13 activities. And again, the team in Pittsburgh shows that intensive plasma exchange in those patients with TAMOF replenish Adams 13 activity and is associated with organ failure recovery if we succeed to replenish Adam 13. So maybe in that type of patients, there is something there that we can do, which is plasma exchange. Another example of what is missed frequently is capillary leak syndrome. All of us uh, see that our patient with MAS has uh, uh, edema everywhere. But sometimes people miss the point that this uh, edema is really caused by a capillary leak. And why is there any capillary leak like that? Well, we know that some cytokines like bradykinin, some leukotriens, platelet aggregating factors widen intracellular uh, 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 space between endothelial cells. Uh, and other cytokines like t uh, tumor necrosis factor, interleukin-1, and again, platelet aggregating factor just uh, are able to cause a destruction of the, uh, uh, of the endothelial cells. So this opened the way the, uh, uh, for um, big molecules like albumin. It gets out from the uh, blood vessels and, and, and it, brings it, it brings with them water, which explains that we have hypoproteinemia, low blood oncotic pressure, and protein ura, and, and, and there are uh, problems that uh, are caused by capillary syndrome. It can cause lung edema. Another example of complication is reactive hemophagocytic syndrome. The reactive hemophagocytic syndromes uh, uh, can cause a lot of things. It causes low platelet counts, leukopenia, so, uh, thus some uh, uh, immunosuppressions, sometimes severe anemia. The diagnosis of hemophagocytic syndrome is quite straightforward. Again, you know, uh, the, the best way to, do, to, the, the, do, uh, to get the diagnosis is to do a med medullary puncture. A, and you can see uh, on the figure that is uh, on the slides an example of that. There is a huge osteocyte, and within the osteocytes, at the same time, you'll see any uh, uh, red cells and a macrophage, which is uh, quite uh, specific. The consequence of that syndrome is that uh, 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 more transfusion may be required. Uh, these patients get a lot of infection, and uh, they can develop the IC and, 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 and some significant bleeding. But if you see that, don't stop treating these patients. They can cure completely. And they don't need any um, of those drugs they use on the oncology units, by the way. Another example that I think people know a little better, better but not as well as I will um, dream of, is the critical illness polyneuropathy and myopathy. In adults, we know what uh, the incidence rate is great. For example, there are people showing that in adults who stay in the ICU more than five days, the incidence rate of neuropathy and or myopathy is uh, 26%. In kids, we have no data. But we know there are cases. I've seen a lot of those cases. Um, there are some risk markers or risk factors of this polymyoneuropathy. Uh, they, have, they are uh, observed in very severe cases. Uh, if patients are over vasopressors during more than three days, they have a good chance to get that, probably, again, because of the severity of illness. If there is a bacteriema, if you need renal replacements, if you use neuromuscular blockage for a long time, you increase the risk of this, too. as well as uh, uh, if you use benzodiazepine or steroids for a long time, you increase the risk to contract a neuropathy or a myopathy. What are the clinical indicators? Well, for the neuropathy, it's simple. You have no... Uh, deep tendon reflex, or they are sluggish. If you have a, a myopathy, and remember, you can get just the neuropathy, you can get the myopathy alone, or both. 
And by the way, in my experience with patients, with, uh, with cardiac patients, cardiac surgery patients, I've seen a, a lot more myopathy than neuropathy. Uh, and uh, uh, that myopathy uh, can be seen because they were unable to raise their arm over the bed. And that's a great sign of proximal muscu mus muscular weakness. And that this is what is typical about that myopathy. It, it attains the uh, proximal muscles. How can we make the diagnosis? Well, for the neuropathy, sometimes if, 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 if just uh, with the reflex, it's enough. But you can do also uh, an electromyography or a muscle bio, uh, a neuromuscular biopsy, but uh, we do that rarely. If you're talking about myopathy, uh, otherwise in the, uh, uh, in the clinics, uh, uh, you can uh, uh, make a biopsy too. What are the consequences? Well, the most frequent consequence is a difficult weaning from the ventilator. Uh, if the myopathy is there, you lose your uh, accessory uh, respiratory muscles. So uh, you can have problems to wean those patients from the respirator. Another problem is severe post ic weakness. In adults, it can remain for years. In kids, we don't know. I have followed a few patients, and it can be there at least for a few months. And I believe there is something that maybe we can do there. Presently, the treatment is symptomatic, but some people believe that we can decrease the severity of those neuropathy or myopathy by uh, uh, starting physical exercise soon in the uh, uh, ICU. So I, I'm aware of a few uh, um, trials that are coming just looking at that, and we'll see what happens. But uh, I believe that we, are, we must do some study on the epidemiology of this critical illness, neuropathy and myopathy. So another uh, 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 list of complications that is frequently ignored is the endocrinological system. Uh, for example, the sick uterid syndrome that was uh, not popular, but a lot of people talk about it in the 80s actually is a problem related to MONS. Same thing with the increase uh, uh, with, with the problem with cortisols and also with the, for example, the pulsatility of growth hormone. Uh, 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 and uh, 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 all these um, abnormalities are related to what's going on in the, uh, in the uh, hypophyses, in the hypophyses. And the other thing that is common uh, uh, is insulin resistance. It's always there if you have uh, some multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. Uh, so Jacques, um, it's a systemic inflammatory response with no clear inciting agent. How do we treat this? Thank you for that question. Uh, I will, my answer will, uh, there will be two parts in my answer. I'll, I will speak about uh, what I will uh, name specific treatment or immunomodulatory approach or major bullet approach and non-specific treatment. Uh, by specific, I mean single molecule. Uh, for example, there is too much TNF or tumor necrosis factors, let's go and give some anti-tumor necrosis factors. There is too much interleukin-1, same thing. Uh, or if there is not enough of a, of a bioreactive agent like activated protein C, let's give activated protein C. Or if, you know, in MODS, usually the level of uh, anti-thrombin-3 is very low, let's give anti-thrombin-3. Well, uh, at least 40, if not 50, randomized clinical trials have been done with that approach, that single molecule approach. Uh, and billions, not billions, billions of dollars have been spent on this. And I just put that, 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 that slides with a, a list of some of those RCTs. Uh, and uh, uh, in red are RCTs that shows that what we thought will help patients kill patients. I talked to you about growth hormone, but it was true also with TNF-alpha receptors. Uh, giving that uh, uh, increased the risk of death. Same things with anti-endotoxin. That was a great, great surprise. In black, the results are so-and-so. We don't know. And probably it doesn't work. The only little uh, um, uh, molecule maybe that looks, uh, that merits, I think, to be looked again is an uh, anti-bactericidal uh, uh, protein uh, inhibitor. This, this, this molecule has been studied um, uh, with an RCT that has been published in the Lancet, but uh, the trials was too small to, to get an answer. 
but it, it, it makes sense that, that this molecule works, but this is not a cytokine at all. It's something else. It's not involved in the inflammatory process. So I think that this is why uh, maybe, maybe it can work. Why magic bullets did not work? I think it is because most inflammatory bioreactive uh, agents are pleiotropic and redundant. And uh, the definition of pleiotropic is one agent modulate many effects. So on that slides, uh, MIP10 just modulate, modulate fever. So it's, it, it, it's not pleiotropic, but interleukin-6 and uh, 8 are pleiotropics. The other point is that all, most of those um, uh, inflammatory uh, agents are redundant which means that one activity is modulated by many agents. And if we, you had uh, on that picture the list of activities of TNF-alpha and interleukin-1, you immediately understand that if you uh, 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 shoot uh, or want to uh, treat only one cytokine like TNF, interleukin-1 would just, I, I believe, it explained at least partly why the uh, one magic bullet approach did not work and why probably it will never uh, work. But that's my opinion, I'm not sure about that. That's why I believe that the future is to get better general support. And what I mean by general support is still giving fluids, mechanical ventilation, and helping the patients go through that big illness. Nutrition probably also, uh, uh, there are data suggesting that good nutrition, not too much, but en enough, can help those patients. What about transfusion? That's my field of, of interest. I'm, I'm sure that uh, uh, too much transfusion is bad for patients, but not enough sometimes is bad too. And the, 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 good, the, the, the uh, important question now is to find when we must give a transfusion. Uh, you know that I've completed a randomized co uh, controlled trial showing that if patients are stable or stabilized, hemodynamically stable or stabilized, uh, they don't need a transfusion. And it's true for cardiac patients, septic patients, for all those patients, it, it was, the results were absolutely consistent. It, it, but if the uh, hemoglobin level is over seven gram per deciliter, you don't need a transfusion. But we don't know about unstable patients at all. And for example, in cyanotic cardiac patients, we don't know also. So there is room there for, for research. What about plasma exchange? We don't know unless there is uh, TAMOF. And even with TAMOF, we have one small study. So we need more than that. What about immunoglobulins? We don't know. So there is, there is room for non-specific treatments. There is room for good trials there, uh, I, I believe, and I think. What do we do at St. Justin? Well, yes, we use ECMO, we use hemofiltration and hemodialysis, but always, for example, to support uh, the kidney for extrarenal operation, not to get rid with the cytokines. But this is something maybe we must look at in a good trials. We give, we still give a significant, uh, uh, well, 30% of our patients still receive a transfusion. Uh, mostly because they are unstable. But as I told you, I'm not sure it's a good thing to do. We need to do more research to, to know the right answer to that. In summary, uh, uh, how sh should we treat MODs? Well, first, control the basic disease. If there is an infection, take care of it. If there is a, a pulmonary uh, um, emboli, take care of it. If there is a, a, a very severe uh, systemic and uh, hemolytic uh, 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 syndromes, uh, treat it. Also support all the organs. Uh, if the kidney, if there is kidney failure, obviously start uh, extraordinary operations. Another point that, uh, that is important is to prevent a second hit and avoid all risk factors and, for example, of nosocomial infection. So if you can, don't use paralyzing agents. Uh, uh, get rid of invasive, invasive mechanical ventilation as soon as you uh, as you can. And if you don't need a catheter, whatever the catheter is, uh, just take out that catheter because it, it, it can cause a second hit. And treat aggressively all complications, even if it looks trivial, because it can uh, cause a MODS or it can entertain the MODS uh, for a long time.
Jacques, that's a wonderful um, overview. What are the take-home messages about multiple organ dysfunction syndrome? Well, I have a few. Uh, I can I have many more, but with respect to that presentation, I think one of the first take-home message is that the diagnostic criteria of MODS can be improved. What we have presently is not useless. It helps us, and we have done great research, but we can improve that. We should look for a better alignment between diagnosis of MODS and its pathophysiology, to give you an example. It means that we must understand in a better way what's going on, at least when it's, it starts. When it's there, we understand quite well, but when, when it starts, we don't know exactly what's going on there. We also, uh, uh, hopefully, we will get better diagnostic criteria uh, that will help us to have better predictive value. Uh, presently, as I tell you, the, the, with different set of diagnostic criteria, the predictive value is very different. Another take-home message is that those new criteria must be validated. And uh, may, uh, uh, another message will be many new technologies, and by technology I mean all tests or uh, uh, that, that maybe we can use, uh, are candidate to describe the severity and to monitor the progression of cases of MOS. Uh, like, for example, art and respiratory uh, variability, or uh, the progression of some biomarkers or cytokine level levels. I believe we need those things in order to follow our patients better than we are presently. Uh, but we have to do research just on that to see what are the best tests or uh, technology that can, we can use to uh, 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 follow our patients. Also, uh, another take-home message, MODS is common. It's at least, it's always over 10%. It can be up to 25 and even 40% in some units. Uh, another message, many kinds of triggering even can cause a MODS, uh, like trauma, extensive surgery, uh, hypoxia, uh, uh, intoxication like monoxide, carbon uh, intoxication, all uh, drowning, uh, and obviously infection can cause uh, MODS. Remember also that the death rate of P uh, PICU patients with MODS is very high. It's between 36 and 54 percent. So we can do better, I think. Um, and the last take-home message is that treatment is mostly supportive with aggressive prevention. So beware of second hits as well as you can. Well, Dr. Jacques Lacroix, thank you for this wonderful talk about multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. And as I said earlier, on behalf of our colleagues around the world, thank you for all of the research that you've done on transfusion-related injuries. Thank you.